Welcome to The FOD, where we bring you insights into the future of digital commerce for free. Season five is all about the move to composable architecture. And, and while it's not a buzzword anymore, there are still a number of unanswered questions, which is why I'm speaking to those who have the answers. In return, if you enjoy our content, we ask you to like and share to spread the message far and wide. Hello, and welcome to episode six of The FOD. Today, I'd like to welcome Rex Bigger, co-founder and CEO of Kabiri. There are a few people out there with the experience Rex has, and seven years ago, he co-founded Kabiri, a specialist headless commerce consultancy based in the UK. At the end of 23, Kabiri joined the Mac Alliance, making them one of 24 SIs in the group globally, and just one of a handful operating in the UK. That's my highlights, Rex. Do you want to share a little bit more? Hi, James. Yes. So, yeah, 2017 was was the the pivot point where we, we decided that um, to band together and, and sort of focus on this whole headless, serverless environment. Um, I mean, composable uh, and Mac weren't even terms used back then, but we'd been working in, a, in the agency world for the past 20 years, and we'd been lived through monoliths. And really around 2015, the death of the monolith was was visible to anyone who was, who was working in that space. You could see that whole method of, of building out things just um, wasn't going to work, wasn't going to work for most clients. And a group of us got together and thought, well, you know, well, we we've seen this happening. We know where this is going to be going. We focus on this technology now. I think we could be at the forefront of this. And that's that's why we formed Kabiri uh, back then. And um, we've always had that focus on what's become known as this composable um, method of, of doing e-commerce. And I think um, that's that's been it's been great for us. And we've seen that growth in, in the industry as well. Nice. I guess when you formed it in, in 2017, it, that composable buzzword wasn't wasn't necessarily there. So, so um, I guess what? How did you uh, define Kabiri at that point in time? So, um, I think the the word everyone was using back then was headless, uh, and um, people kind of got what that meant. So, we could talk about um, having a, uh, using headless technologies to build the site. We could talk about decoupling certain bits of functionality from uh, other areas, and, and we could we could explain that to people about how best they could use. Um, their tools uh, and part of that was then looking and saying well we could build you a CMS but you know there are CMSs out there you can buy and I think it was that first or really was the probably driven by CMSs uh, and building out front ends that really started making people think about how got people to think about how they could build out their site to, to fit their business needs uh, and uh, and that's really where we came in and it was very much a, a starting from a technological uh, point of view and talking to the sort of the CTOs and heads of architecture and, and getting that information to them first and foremost. Okay, okay. Well, I know that um, kind of during that period of maybe say uh, 2012 to 2020, there was certainly uh, a lot of demand for uh, end customers to try and uh, rip the head off their, their their monoliths and give them that flexibility that they need within the, the customer experience piece. And before we move into the, the to to the next part, you guys joined the Mac Alliance at the end of last year. Um, they've grown from single figures to over 100 members now. What what does that mean for Kabiri, Rex? So it's, it's very interesting for us because we, I say we've been doing this for seven years now. And uh, when the Mac Alliance formed, it was it was one of those weird things we think, well, we've been doing this. I'm not sure the, the industry needs this because, you know, we, 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 we know what it's, what we're doing. We're, we're telling people how best to look at this. Uh, and the Mac Alliance seemed to be sort of coming along maybe um, just focusing on it from well, at the time we thought maybe it's just a you know, marketing gimmick to try and try and promote a few companies. We've seen that though change over the years and it's become a sort of movement to really get that message out there and um, promote uh, the understanding of how sort of composable technologies and how this all sort of hangs together. And I think that's been really valuable um, for it to, to be doing that. And it's made our job easier being outside the Mac Alliance, so explaining those terms. So uh, last year, um, we decided that probably it's worth us going through the process of joining the Mac Alliance. Um, um, we're both saying the same things to the same people, so we might as well be, be singing from, you know, be one one team working together to promote that message out there. So, so yes, we started that process last year, and um, yes, we we finalised that just before the end of the year and became one of those final few um, to hit the hundred mark to get the hundred um, Mac certified cast. Um, be one of those Partners. final 100 max certified partners. Nice. And yeah, and as I said at the start, I think there's about 20, I think that I looked yesterday, there's 24 SIs, there's a couple of GSIs. Um, so the lion's share of those uh, 
members of the alliance are the, the vendors of different shapes and sizes. Um, there's obviously got quite a stringent uh, qualification quite criteria as well, haven't they? So as, as a uh, partner, what do you guys have to sh to show to to qualify for that? Well, it, it's it's good. I mean, it it puts a bit of um, rigor into the process, on, especially from an SI point of view. I think from a from an ISV, um, it's very easy to see how you could be max certified. There are certain criteria that you need to be as a, as a cloud tool to to hit that. But it's a bit more woolly when it comes to to the SIs. And I think pushing uh, pushing the requirement that you, you have to have done. Uh, composable projects that you're promoting the whole composable Mac um, art, uh, themes out there that you're you're you know, helping the community you know you're doing things like this podcast or you know writing articles about the technologies and how they work together and how composable can help businesses and you know doing outreach and meeting people proving that you can do all that and you've been doing that I think um, shows that you are actually right for that space and that's that's one of the key components from from joining the Mac Alliance. Nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like you said, I guess for as an as an ISV, it's far more uh, easy to define if they do follow the map principles. Sorry. Um. But okay. Um. Yeah. We just touched upon it. The the Mac Alliance has certainly brought a lot of uh, um, a lot of attention to to that movement, and I think it's helped um the educate the whole education piece within the composable transformation um substantially um i guess it that leads on to leads on to, well to the first question then which is the talking about the growth of composable and we, we touched upon it at the start and the reason why you set kabiri up in the first place but how have you seen the the industry develop sort of from 2010 to, to where we are now yes i think i say well at the start of the of, of kabiri we were mainly talking to the ctos and heads of architecture and I think that was really back then. Those were the people who were getting the the way that the the shift in technology was moving. They could see that um, buying a one size fits all monolith um, wasn't going to work for every business. And they they were already those sort of people were already trying to think of solutions of how best they could get um, a great payment system implemented or a, or a PIM or or um, or a CMS. And they were trying to work out how their stacks could be changed. So when that whole rise of of these cloud-based tools started to appear, they were the first people to really think, oh, actually, this could work for us. We could we could build on that. And that's how I say it. We originally we would talk to people, we'd talk to those people, they would get they'd understand what we were talking about. We'd be able to say how it could work best for their business and we could to move it forward from there. What we've seen in the most recent years, probably in the last three or four years, and uh, and I suspect that the outreach from the likes of the Mac Alliance has helped with this, is that you're seeing not just the technology uh, professionals of the company starting to hear these words it's the it's the business people and i think it started really with those marketing people when you start talking to the marketing teams of how they can personalize uh, content for customers um, uh, and how best to serve those customers on a on a very fast turnaround so not like the days of the monolith where you had to maybe plan stuff months in advance where you could now sort of think about making changes for that week or that day when when you start talking to those people and they see the benefits for the business rather than from a technological point of view they started to become the drivers of moving in that direction. Uh, and that has spread out uh, amongst sort of the, the wider platform. I think the CFOs are probably going to be the last people to convince because they were used to seeing one license fee for one product. Now they have like eight, 10 licenses they have to negotiate. Uh, and those prices ultimately will be less than probably a monolith. But you've got you've got a lot more hassle around setting them up and managing them and doing that. So I think there will be the last few people who are on board. But I think now we're definitely seeing that point from the businesses starting to push this uh, this agenda rather than just from the technology. Okay, you raise a valid point there with the uh, the CFO is probably being the last people to to come on board. Um, my understanding is, and so I'm not heavily involved in the space is that you'd have multiple different licenses and they you have to pay them off in slightly different ways so some might be based on gmv some could be based on something completely different which then um obviously raises other questions internally as well you i imagine you've been involved in tens of these conversations with with existing and potential customers what advice do you give them when it comes to getting the cfo on board so then the route that it's it's looking at the, the essentially the return on the investment you're getting um, by going down this this Mac composable route. You're going to be delivering change quicker. Um, it's going to be more efficient to manage mo moving forward. Uh, so it's the, all those other costs. So it's not necessarily thinking about the license costs. It's the costs to you as a business for 
just doing the updates, just waiting for change to happen. You know, the the missed costs by not implementing that new piece of functionality before your competitor. So all those sort of things is really where that bottom line is going to be and how you can pull, you can save money there. And that's going to be, that's your long-term savings. You know, the hit from license fees or the hit from development is only going to be over those first couple of years, really. And then it will start become part of your 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 yearly, year on year. Uh, budgeting but it's those it's those savings across the board that you'll be making um, I think that's that's the way to that's the way to sort of promote the the idea to the CFOs that the, yes there might be more work initially setting up these things but once everything's running you'll start seeing savings across the board uh, and the, the benefit to the business is, is much greater that way okay and I guess that that also links in then with trying to uh, show ROI as fast as you can um, to them so they can start to see some of that impact as well because I, I think um maybe what what can happen is um you um you have this desire to move to a composable uh, architecture and um there's definitely a little bit of a misunderstanding in with regards to its complexity in the market and i think a lot of companies maybe expect it to go from start to finish pretty quickly and without a huge amount of complications and um i guess what you i guess you need to remember then is that actually it's a journey and the, the the key benefits of mo- of making this movement is are going to come later down the line. You're going to have that flexibility. You're not going to be tied in. The costs are going to get cheaper. But actually, at the start, it is going to be more challenging and, and complex and and hard and, and expensive. Is, is that kind of a fair summary? Yeah, and and I think that's that's where the the speed of development comes into to its own. So one thing we would normally say is that the composable doesn't have doesn't have to be complex. There's a perception that it is this hard thing to do and there's all these moving parts and you have to understand how they, they pull together. But um, if you're doing it right, and if, if you know, like several companies out there, we have accelerators, if you have that sort of groundwork in place to ha- make that easier, you're actually developing a lot quicker. If you're developing a lot quicker, the cost for that development is gonna be lower than say in, in the monolith days where you'd get maybe a GSI to come in put in one of the, the large monoliths and spend two to three years doing that. That doesn't need to happen anymore. You, you can you can build out sites in six months easily that are fully functional, fully featured. What what you're looking for as a business. And you're at that six month point, you're already making, uh, you know, you're already recouping those uh, that cost from the customers because you're already putting out that change to the customers and you can start seeing that, that money coming back into the company. You're not sitting on a project that's going to be two years down the line before you see any see any um recoup yeah okay and you touched upon the accelerators there as well and that was a point that i wanted to mention because i know kabiri uh has its own accelerator i think yours is called ashiba um a, um a number of the other uh si's do as well which shows that's a, a movement to try and get customers on um up and running quickly we've also seen commerce tools come to market in the last 12 months with their connect product and and now foundry which i believe is similar it allows the 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 vendors to talk to to each other far quicker so to me that's a real uh development in the in in the making the movement towards a composable architecture but um i guess how much of a game changer really is it so from our point of view i mean we we developed uh, Ashiba really early on, I think about 2020, um, when we started, uh, when it sort of had its first sort of release. Um, and the, the way we looked at it, there was a lot of, and I think this is where the tools like Foundry and Connect have come from, there was a lot of boilerplate. There's only a certain number of ways you can connect a CMS to a front end or a payment system to your, to your commerce platform. Uh, and looking at um, how those were, there's so much commonality there that really the focus needs to be on the business logic and the business rules that are going to be sitting outside that. The actual creating an order is always going to be the same. You know, it's, at, at its core, the way of creating order is going to be the same, no matter which platforms you're using. So it's more about what specific business rules need to be applied to that order. And that's where we saw the benefit of having an accelerator at that point. If we had done all that boilerplate at the back end, so that we could move really quickly with those connections and you could swap out different CMSs or different PMs or different payment platforms or searches or promotions engines. And you can just pull them all in because you've got that core uh, connectivity um, at the back end. The actual the work you're doing is really towards the business requirements rather than just setting it all up. And that really does knock a, a large amount of time off of the off of the build uh, build pipeline. 
I mean, we, we would normally say typic, for a typical composable project, we'd be looking at somewhere between three plus months being cut from the, from the timeline just because we've got that accelerator in place. Okay, wow, so that's, that's a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking less than a year for uh, for a project, I mean, it, it is, a, is a big chunk of that time that you're you're saving by by going down an accelerated route. And I think where Foundry and Connect come in, and they uh, the commerce tools have seen where what where those tools are needed um, again to answer that um, complexity question that a lot of um, customers have. And I think it's really it benefits those uh, um, agencies that don't have an accelerator in place or haven't got that. Um, long track record of how to build these projects or how to work uh, the platforms out there. So it gives them a, a step on the ladder. So it's their first step to saying, okay, we, we know how these connections work because we're, we're being given them so we can start from there. And it's kind of a shortcut for those guys to really, really get moving. And I think uh, it helps. Um, I think people talk about digital maturity a lot when we talk about Composable. And I help having a, I think having a product like Foundry helps those sort of customers who aren't quite there with the understanding. And okay. I think this comes back to looking at how composable has grown so when you've got uh, a company that has, is reading all the good um text out there about how this is going to benefit their business but maybe haven't got that tech driven focus to get there it's more coming from the business side it helps those people understand okay it's not a monolith but it's a here's a package solution that we can start working with uh, and i think that 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 really helps those sort of businesses get get started but um yeah, I think from a, from an agency point of view, having a tools like Foundry and Connect to help them kickstart that process as well. But as yeah, I say, okay. we've had an accelerator now for four years, uh, and we build and iterate on it every with learnings from every project to try and understand how best we can tailor it to the marketplace as it is. And that that always gives us that step up when we when we go and see a customer and say, well, yes, we can do this in X months because we know your business. You know, we've looked at what your business does. We see how that fits our accelerator, and then we can really we can start pushing those the speed delivery. Nice. Well, I, it was in the last season I spoke to a guest, and he, he actually highlighted um, he wish he'd spoken to the uh, the delivery partner first of all because they actually had accelerators for some slightly different products which they could have used, but because they picked the they picked their vendors first of all, they then couldn't go back on that, and it actually made it quite a complex. Uh, impl- uh, implementation but had he had that conversation first of all they might have gone a slightly different route and they would have shaved a lot of time off their overall transformation so something that's definitely worth thinking about um which i guess also leads nicely into the question of uh in, if you were on the customer side who would you who would you engage first the the vent the soft the, the software vendors or the delivery partners it, it's a, it's an interesting question i think for, as an agency we'd always say come to us first <laughs> we can we can help you get get to where you are I think the from a from a business point of view, it's very easy to go out there and get information about all these tools and try and work out what's best for you. I, one of the one of the phrases that's used a, a lot in this uh, in this industry is best of breed, and it's something that I, I personally quite I hate. It doesn't okay. matter how good a product is if it's not right for your business, it's not the right product. So we we like to say best of need, you know. So if you were engaging us first, we would go in, we'd do a discovery phase, we'd look at your requirements. Uh, we'd look through what you wanted to do in, in certain areas of function. I'd say, well, actually, these tools probably best fit you here. Uh, and, and you know, say, have a look at these and move that way forward. We do find a, a lot of customers that um, go first to the, the marketplace and look at the vendors. Um, they're naturally drawn to the ones that have the, the better publicity, the better marketing uh, uh, and the better, um, you know, the better uh, visibility out in the marketplace. Where sometimes they might not be the best tools for their for their business. Uh, and it requires them then to do a lot of that groundwork to really understand what those tools can do and what they can offer the business. So I guess if you're if you're have a strong technical department who are, are always looking at the new technologies, then I think it works for the the customer to really can do that. They can put, look at what their business needs, uh, and that team can do the deep dives into those technologies to make sure it is the right tool for them. But if you haven't got that focus, then I think um, engaging the agency first, who has experience with with a lot of tools, um, is 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 a good way to go. I mean, we're we're part of the Mac Alliance, but um, you know we're partners with about forty different ISVs in that space. Some of some of whom aren't even Mac Alliance members, um, but we, you know we understand their technologies. We've worked with them in the past, so it gives us an, a broad range of. Um, understanding the crowd across the technology stack of how those different tools can help different businesses. So I think it swings around a bit. If you're if you're a, if you're very much a 
a tech driven company, I think your, your tech team probably have a good understanding of what they need and, and can help make those decisions. But if you if you need help on that, I think going to an agency who has experience with a lot of vendors is a good is a good path to go down. OK, OK. All right. Um, I guess let's move on to the next question. Uh, and this is one of my favorite questions um, that I ask everybody. Uh, Surprisingly, the answers do differ. In your opinion, Rex, um, what is the number one reason why uh, composable transformations fail? Uh, in my in my viewpoint, I think it's it's, it's it's there's twofold, and it all comes down to culture. I think to to make get a successful composable transformation, you have to work with the business of the customer you're working with, and that's not just at the at the technical level, it has to work at all levels from the sea level all the way down to the people who are going to be using the tools day in and day out. Because there's a very different mindset using going composable. You're you're essentially saying to the person, you don't need to know how the whole platform works, but what we'll do is we'll give you the best solution for you to do what you need to do. For example, a merchandiser, you know, we really tailor the the search and merch solution to them, to their business needs. And have make sure they have the right tool and the right experience and, and all the all the utilities there to to really to really make the most of that. Um, but they might not have access to the PIM or they might not have access to the CMS. But then it's more of a question of do they need to have that access? Is that part mm. of their role, or should they should they really be working with the CMS team to make sure the right content is going out with the right right products and, uh, and merchandising tools? So that's one aspect of it. I'd say if you haven't if you can't work with the business and get them to understand how it's going to work. There's always going to be problems getting that that project out to, to market. But then the, the flip side of that is with this move to Composable, and I think it's something like 30% of, of new projects are starting to be pushed out there in, in the Composable space. That means there's a lot of agencies who've been around longer than us who, who have experience building websites are naturally going to be picked to do some of this work. Now, if you've been working on monoliths for 15 years and you're suddenly working in, in the composable space, you have a, you have built up a team that understands how to deliver an e-commerce platform. But the way composable projects work, you kind of have to flip that on its head. So if people have come, if you've got a, a large agency in who've been doing this for donkey's years, they'll come in and they'll talk about your customer and they'll talk about the, the what your customer needs to see in the customer journey and, and the experience around that. And these are all things that you need to consider. But in the composable space, you first of all, you've got to think about how you're going to plug everything together before you can think about that. If you start from the customer first and then try and shoehorn the composable product in to make that work, you're always going to be playing catch up. You're never going to be in the right space. It's better to understand how the business works to make sure that the underlying architecture is there. And then you can apply the customer journey over the top. And I think this comes from the fact that in the days of the monolith, you didn't have to worry about that underlying architecture. It was already there and you already knew how to do it. So you could get, jump straight in with the customer side of things. But here you have to really think about how the, the business is going to be served by those tools first and foremost, and then start thinking about the customer journey and the experience and, and all the stuff that really makes the site and that's it's around that okay i think flying okay. in the wrong direction is gonna is always gonna slow you down and that will lead to non-delivery of the of the right functionality yeah okay so you you mentioned two two points there the first one was the, the cultural element of the the business itself and having everyone a uh, bought in and aware of the change and how it's going to impact them which which yeah I, I completely agree with and i know that has proven challenging for some businesses and they've had it opposed other 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 areas um but the, the point you mentioned there about the the delivery partner i find really interesting as well because ultimately that goes down to an educational piece from the partner and and making sure that they they know what they're doing in the first place um uh, you kind of think maybe you would you would check that out first of all, maybe with a few case studies and uh, see what's going on in the market. But you know what? I guess maybe not. Um, are, you, are you seeing much of those um, problems yourself in the market where a delivery partners gone in and they haven't educated the client in the right way, and actually they're they're they're, they're doing exactly what you said you shouldn't be? Oh yeah, I mean I think when we've gone into a couple of projects to try and turn them around, uh, and. It, I'd say 99% of the time it is that that is going on where you'll have the an agency coming in and doing the thing, doing it the way they've always done it. Uh, and I think 
because of this huge education piece that you need to do with the business as well, doing it the way you've always done it from an agency point of view normally means leaving the client in the dark until it's done. Uh, and those two factors together really are, you know, they're, they're a recipe for disaster. You're not going to achieve what you need to achieve by going down that route. So having that dialogue with the customer, that education piece with the customer is, is critical to understanding how you can deliver a composable project. And if you don't understand yourself how to do that or how to deliver a composable project, that's never going to work. Mm. Uh, and I, I think the majority of those failed cases are are those sort of companies that have gone in with, um, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those agencies. You know, if they were doing a, um, say, a SAP Commerce Cloud or Salesforce or even Shopify, you know, they're all pretty much out of the box tools and they can they can really run with those. And if they've been doing them for years, they can probably do them fantastically well. But because it's a different way of thinking about the technology and a different way of utilizing those technologies, unless you've done that, it's always going to be tricky unless you've worked out the, the right approach to doing it. It's, it's going to be a shift in the way your teams work, but also the shift in the way you you build out the stuff. And I think even from a from a GSI point of view, your, you know, Oh, you know, the business model of GSI is to make sure that the customer has the right resources available to them over an extended period. And, you know, one of the benefits of going composable and using this sort of Mac framework is you can deliver really quickly. You don't need to be there three, four years. That's so again, it's it's working out how best that's going to work with their business models to to understand what it is that customer is going to need moving forward, not just a technical solution. There'll be other things that need to be factored in there. Okay, something you you spoke about there was uh, uh, SAP Commerce, Shopify, etc. being predominantly out of the box. Um, there, there's there's obviously been a lot of talk over the last couple of years of of SAP in particular trying to break down their platform. And for for many in the SAP world, they would now say SAP Commerce is is composable. Well, what's your first thoughts at that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you can look back in history and look at how Oracle did it with ATG and Oracle Commerce. They went composable with Oracle Commerce Cloud, or they went headless, as they would call it back then. And it was it was just Oracle sitting in in a cloud somewhere. <laughs> there was nothing different around. Uh, and I think the way the likes of SAP are sort of decoupling their tools, and same even Salesforce saying that they've got this like composable front end. It's like the reality is it's still that monolith there, and, and you'll still have all that connectivity. To if you went to down the route of using um, an SAP or a Salesforce and, and went down their composable model, and a year into it, you're thinking, you know what, the search just isn't working for me. I need to plug this in. It's not going to be a simple matter of just saying, okay, I'm not going to use that search anymore. I'm going to use this search. It, 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 there is a lot more work that's going to need to be done there, and pulling it apart and decoupling those those tools, almost uh, almost like a strangulation method in itself, just to pull it away from that search. You can plug in the new search. And and I think I, with the likes of Salesforce anyway, you're still going to be paying for that old search, even though you've now plugged in something else. Yeah. So so until I think until they truly take a step back uh, and rebuild their platforms from the ground up to un, to be truly modular and, com- and composable, I don't think we're going to see. I don't think we're going to see that shift. I don't say, you know, doing it in this half-hearted way to keep the old platform alive, keep the new platform moving forward that way. I don't think that's going to truly get them to that composable point that they, they want to. No, it's funny. The first, whenever I, I've raised that question any, anywhere, the, almost all of the time, the first part of the response is uh, to do with ATG's uh, demise uh, over about 10 years ago or so. So and the comparisons are always going to be there, I believe. Um, but it's fair to say, a chap I spoke to recently, he he referred to the, the bigger vendors um, uh, adding different layers to their product, almost as in like um, a system onion. And if you want to get rid of it, you're going to have to peel back all of these different layers to then strangle it, like you said. So, so yeah, it's just interesting because you, you obviously got guys like yourself who very much use the best of need, uh, I should say, uh, in terms of the technologies and 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 the 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 products that are built API first. And you've got the vendor, the the bigger vendors like your SAPs and your sales forces that uh, they're obviously fighting hard to to uh, make their platforms more modular and and more modern 
But um, the, I mean, they're never going to build it from the ground up again, right? There's 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 far too many customers already using using them, and it's be far too much of an expense for them. So okay, so when you're speaking to a customer, what are the uh, the, the the top three things that you would advise them to ensure a successful transformation? So depending on who we're talking to the customer again, it would be talk to the people who are going to be using it. So if we're talking to like a CTO, be an understanding of which business people are going to be using it, how they're going to be moving forward with the platform uh, and get an understanding of their their requirements uh, and getting those people involved early and, and keeping them in the conversation throughout the, the project is going, to, is going to help make that more of a, a successful uh, approach. Um, I think then choosing the... Um, choosing ISVs that are going to help you get there as well is is a key to that. Um, you know, work with them, find out what their almost find out what their requirements are for you as a customer, so that you can understand if your model fits with with one of the t- one of the platforms you're looking at. For example, if you if you want to move fast, but the platform you're looking at wants to do a, a three month deep dive into your architecture to make sure that they can tailor it perfectly to you that might not be the right solution for you even though it's a great product so you need to start thinking about how they they're going to work with you uh, and again i guess this is one of the the, the supposed complexities of, of composable each of those isvs are going to have a slightly different way of working so it's about understanding how they're going to work with your platform how you they're going to support you moving forward and how they're going to support your your business users and and, and it's I think the the key to success in Composable is all about this communication bubble, about having everyone understanding what needs to be done across across all those different moving parts. And I think that getting that right will will ensure a successful project. So moving on to question number four, and we touched upon this one in question number two. Um, however, what would be the number one thing that you would advise a customer to do before finalizing their SI selection? I think look at uh, what that SI has done in the past. Um, look at yeah. I think case studies are, are key to this. Uh, I mean, they're always going to be they're always going to be rose tinted, but it, it's good to look at what what that company has achieved, how what how those projects have gone, and if there are any sort of you know um, accolades in the marketplace about it. If the, it's not just it's not just them telling you they're giving you a great case study, but other people out there saying, oh, no, that was a great project. You should look at these guys because of that. Um, I think having that experience behind any SI is, is key. And this goes back to, you know, to trying to ensure you've got a successful project coming along. Have, a, have an SI who has done this in the past, who has the built composable projects, and who have clients who are willing to say, oh, no, that was really good. That worked for us. We were able to move fast. Uh, you know, we're seeing it, the, uh, we're seeing the benefits already. I think moving forward that way. That's that's where you need to be talking to those SIs and understanding how they've got to that point. Okay, I mean, I think you made a good point there. I mean, this isn't a, a new thing anymore. We've been doing this for some time. You guys have been doing this now for the best part of seven years. Uh, you also mentioned uh, a stat earlier, which I hadn't heard of before, but I think you said about thirty percent of new projects um, are sort of composable in in, in mind. So. Um, there's obviously a lot of new projects coming through year on year as well, which which means there's a lot of people you can be speaking to uh, in the market. The digital commerce space is is pretty small um, and a lot of people know each other. So I definitely agree. I think if you are going to be kicking off a project, the first thing you want to be doing is looking at, OK, who have you guys worked with before? Who who do I know there or do I know anyone that knows someone there? And, and let's get the, the lay of the land to see, to see actually did it go as as well as maybe they, they, say, they say it did. No, exactly. I think um, talking to people like the Mac Alliance as well is, is good for that because they they've got a, a breadth of of case studies that they've worked with and, and they haven't you know they've seen those projects come over the last few years. So you could you could go to those guys talk about what what, what projects have happened that um, were successes and they can point you at those companies and that, and I think you know at at a very high level most companies will want to talk about successful projects. So, you know, I think it's a matter of reaching out if you're, if you're a senior exec in one company, talking to a senior exec in another and saying, honestly, how did it go for you guys? I think you you, you can have those sort of honest conversations, I think. Um, and people are more than happy to talk about when things go well. <laughs> I, I guess maybe what you want to know, though, is when things don't go so well, because that's when you get to understand exactly exactly who you're working with and how it was dealt with. Um, but maybe it's a bit harder to get that that information <laughs> yeah you might have, to, might have to read between the lines for that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh definitely um okay cool so last question then rex so where do you see the market moving from here 
I can only see more composability happening, uh, more tools out there that really enable you to to build up the stack that you need for your for your business. Um, I don't see that that change in anywhere. I think there's going to be a movement towards more sort of commoditized accelerator type type things that um, do a lot of that wiring up for you to start off with. Um, I think Connect is like it's Commerce Tools version of that, but you can look at stuff like Patchworks that's all going down that route to enable you to do that that connectivity without having to have um, that initial build out or, or or an accelerator in the back end. You can start working early on to getting those those products talking to each other. So I think you'll see a movement that way to consolidate things. I think also you'll start to see, especially over the next year or so, you'll start to see tools that manage that platform. I think people still love the fact that with a monolith, everything looks the same, everything's in one place. I think you're going to start to see people developing uh, products that sort of sit above all these tools and because everything's headless anyway and all, all the all the actual admin screens are API first. It's mm -hmm. not a, a, mar, a million miles away to build out that layer of, of you know uniform dashboards for the business to be able to get to any component. People don't do it because, of course, that's development time to build it all out, which is more cost. But I think you're going to see um, companies develop their own sort of homogenous interface so that people can to have that layer above everything, sort of a management panel for your composable okay. stack. I think that's um, definitely something that would, would would go down well in the market. I mean, one of the things that I one of the frustrations that I hear regularly is is people have gone from having um, one system to log into for everything to having multiple and they all operate in a slightly different way and and what have you so actually having that one layer above that can almost put them back to so it means not not, see not what they're used to but just having one system rather than seven eight nine ten is certainly going to be well well perceived internally so that would that would definitely be uh, uh, a good movement do you are you hearing of that happening at the minute or do you think that's maybe something that's slightly slightly longer away I would say I started hearing about it about a year and a half ago when a, a couple of vendors we were talking to were starting to think about how they could do it. Um, but then AI hit, and I think everyone pivoted from doing that to getting on the AI bandwagon. So everyone has the AI tools that have been developed over the last year. And I think all that that other side of things have been put on the back burner. So I think okay. we might see that again. Once, once everyone has their own AI integrated into their systems doing something, I think then we'll start to see more of that user interface stuff coming back again. Got yeah. Although I, I feel like the we're still very much at the start of the AI journey, and I think once uh, I mean every every year or so we're going to start to unlock more and more of its potential, and I can just see that really just taking over everything over the next few years. It's going to be interesting to see where it goes for sure. Um, but going back away from AI and back to how you said about um, consolidation of the different vendors. But where does that end, in your opinion? Because if you can keep consolidating and, and whether they acquire different vendors or they just link them together via the APIs, I mean, ultimately, you could argue that they're moving back towards a monolith, albeit different vendors. So wh wh where does it where does that end for you? I mean, it's a good point. And I think we could, I mean, you see these cycles in, in IT anyway, and it could be that there is a new generation of monoliths about to appear, but um, like a generation of monoliths where you can just plug and play as you as you need. Um, and it could be that that would be the death knell of, the, of your traditional monoliths, your Salesforce and your SAP, because why buy this large monolith that you can't change anything? When you can buy this monolith, the, you can change everything in it you want to, and it's already built out for you to be able to do that. So that could be a direction we end up having it. And um, we're with companies developing these suite of tools that they can work together, but you don't have to use them all. And you can you and they have partners that work better with them. I think there might be that sort of angle of things going. And I think that will work for a lot of customers who who don't want the perceived complexity of having different tools. They want sort of a one one size fits all solution, but that they can change as they need. So the, we could see that happening. And I, I think that that's definitely something that probably will occur in in the future. But um, I think it'll be more from a from a point of view that you can chop and change everything, uh, whereas your sales forces you can't. And I think that's going to be the differentiator between those two things. And it might only appeal to certain types of enterprise that just want, you know, one check going out per month, uh, mm. and they'll take that on board that way. 
A one a one size fits all, hey. Da- dangerous phrase that is, Rex. <laughs> um, but no, I, I like it, and, and I, I kind of see things going going that same way. I think what we're seeing at the minute is, is an indicator to to that continuing. And um, yeah, how far it goes, I'm not sure. Um, I'm nowhere near as educated as someone like yourself. But if I was a, a better man, I would say we're going to continue to see that for the next couple of years. And and uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you can give the customer a, 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 a product that does pretty much everything that they want and they have the ability to chop and change it easily or fairly easily anyway then uh it seems like it makes sense yeah and i guess that's our that's our job as an si is to is to ensure that what the customer has at the end of any work we do for them is a platform that enables them to do that and that they understand how to do that with and can grow with them uh, and works for their business um at the moment you know that will be composed of uh a bunch of different tools to work for their business needs uh, and in the future that might be more you'll go to a vendor who can say well i i'm partnered with these guys and this is a this is a solution for you but um yeah i think ultimately it's our job to make sure that our customers have that when we when we, when we leave them that they are, are in that position to make those decisions and, and to swap out tools as they see fit nice all right well i think that leads us nicely to the end of the episode so um yeah Thank you very much for your time, Rex. It's been great talking to you. Um, and yeah, obviously shared some great insights today. And I think that my key takeaway um, across a, a lot of the conversation has been communication, whether that be internally and making sure the whole business is brought into the journey um, or whether that be with your delivery partners um, both, and your vendors, both at the start of the process and throughout that whole process through to through to go live. Communication is, is absolutely fundamental to, to um, a successful transformation um so yeah thanks for joining me thanks james it's been a pleasure awesome and to our audience if you're still there and you're listening then uh thanks again for tuning in um please do subscribe like share um and just get this content in front of those that need it Uh, as i said before if it helps one person make the right decision moving forward then it's doing its job and i'll see you again soon thank you 